All right. Looks like we have everyone joining. Okay. Uh, so, hi everyone, and welcome to our fifth uh, FCCF uh, virtual classroom on Flojo version 10.6.2. Um, so for everyone that has uh, joined us already, you're uh, somewhat familiar with the platform uh, that we're um, doing for this class. And for those that are a bit new, um, it's uh, my name is Kathy Daniels, <laughs> the manager of the uh, Flow Cytometry Core Facility at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And we say welcome to everybody. Uh, you'll see a new and friendly face today, uh, which is John Quinn, uh, Dr. John Quinn. And he's been uh, nice enough to join us today uh, as we go over high parameter data analysis, uh, specifically TSNI and OPSNI in uh, Flojo version 10.6.2. Uh, so I'm just going to go over uh, a very brief introduction and then hand it over to John. Um, so just a summary of what we're going to be going over today. Uh, John will be talking about uh, high parameter data analysis in Flojo. Specifically, um, you know, understanding and an, uh, analyzing some of the clustering alg algorithms that are available and how to utilize those algorithms like TSNI and OPSNI um, in uh, Flojo 10.6.2, which is the newest version. And then as that goes along, as we, um, as we know, there'll be some best practices that, uh, that come up that we can uh, discuss throughout the duration of the, the classroom. So some important links. Uh, Flojo has been very wonderful in providing uh, at-home uh, licenses for free while many people are working from home due to the current uh, COVID situation. So we thank them for that. And you can go ahead and visit their website specifically there. Um, or if you need to download Flojo or um, get any information, they have plenty available on their website. Then we have the Flow Cytometry Core Facility website at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, on this website, we have recordings of all of our previous sessions. So we've gone over an introduction uh, to Flojo, compensation, instrument characterization, cell cycle and proliferation, and all of those videos are available on our website. We advertise a lot of this educational content or all of this educational content on our Twitter, and our handle is flowmskcc. Uh, in addition to educational content and sharing things that are going on in the community, we also have little entertainment series <laughs> um, where we have some parodies to uh, parody songs that we've converted to flow, right? Because <laughs> we miss the lab very much. <laughs> then we also uh, have here the uh, ISAC website, International Society for the Advancement of Cytometry. We want to thank them also for providing free content on Cyto University as many people are working from home. Flow repository is a nice resource, especially for today. Uh, so if you don't have any high parameter data yourself on your, um, on your computers as you're working from home and you don't have access, please feel free to visit flowrepository.org where you can download FCS files from published data. And a lot of that will be high parameter and you can utilize that to test, um, to test these high parameter applications okay. and analysis. Then we have uh, the Cytometry Part A journal that uh, is a good, a great resource to anyone looking for flow cytometry um, data and, and content. We have our regional flow cytometry users groups, uh, specifically Metro Flow, which is New York, New Jersey, uh, that has in-person um, meetings in addition to potentially some, uh, some virtual meetings. And then we also have Flowtex, uh, which is the uh, kind of uh, organization over at, or users group over in Texas that has been uh, super wonderful throughout this whole um, current situation with providing educational content and they have a listing of all of their content on their website as well. And lastly, um, we have a YouTube link to how to convert a text or image file to an FCS file by David Gravano, which is how you saw that little tease me plot. <laughs> um, earlier on and we love playing around with that. So that's how we've been getting all of that. So please visit there. Okay, so some contacts. Uh, we have John Quinn, um, his Flojo uh, email right there up top. And in addition, we have Rui's email and myself. Please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. But I do wanna stress that uh, as we go along, if you do have any questions, please feel free to utilize the chat function. Um, we'll be monitoring that and uh, you know, interrupting uh, John as questions come up, we're answering them ourselves. So please, we uh, encourage you to utilize that function. 
And with that, I just want to say thank you to our group who's been phenomenal throughout this whole process. Um, you know, I keep saying it and I'll continue to say it. So before, during and after, um, very lucky to work with the group that we do. Um, so we say thank you. So again, please go ahead and ask questions. I'm going to pass this along to John and say thank you again to John for being so wonderful in uh, joining us today. Okay. All right, my, my pleasure to talk with you all. All right, let me share my screen. Um, I'll say super prescient uh, reference to uh, Flow Repository. Um, you know, Kathy mentioned that we've got an hour and a half to work with today and we want to do high parameter data. Uh, so I went big. I went and grabbed a 40 color data set off of Flow Repository uh, that a friend of mine recently put up. Uh, it's a pretty nice set. And that's what I've got loaded up into Flowjo. Uh, sorry, I don't have, I didn't write the flow repository link anywhere on the screen, but I think if you search 40 color data, there won't be that many choices and you'll be able to get the exact set if you'd like to do so. Okay, uh, I should probably do uh, my best to contribute to the recent public service announcements and mention we at Flojo advise you not to inject bleach directly into your lungs. Please don't. And with that, let us talk some Flojo. I think I will also turn off my camera. So, hi. Uh, here's my smiling face from inside my fortress of solitude. And that was probably enough for that. And we can save some bandwidth and stop video here also. Okay. Group chat is up. So, I've got data already loaded in. Um, I've got it already compensated. I did the compensation in Flojo. I considered showing that as well but I think I wanna focus more on some of the high parameter tools. I did use spectral compensation on this data, but it was a bit of a bear to get that done with a lot of adjusting. Uh, I think I might end up using most of the time doing it. I'll mention you can do that. And I'll mention that also on our website, I actually just did a Flojo spectral compensation webinar. I believe that was last Thursday. And so I'll point to that as well. I did wanna immediately go to our website and say, uh, a lot of the tools that I'm gonna work on today, are actually available as plugins. And so what a plugin is, is just a little bit of Java code that adds on some functionality that is encoded already into Flojo. And we try to make it pretty easy uh, to get these in. Uh, some are easier than others because some will depend on a little bit of R, but one of the things I'll show you is the plugin wizard that's going to, I think, help out quite a bit with that. So if you're looking at Flojo under the workspace tab and populations, there is a drop down for plugins. The top choice is the Flojo Exchange. And if you click that, you end up at our website. And I'm just gonna stretch this out from behind the zoom controls a little bit. Okay, so Flojo Exchange here, which is just flojo.com, downloads, exchange, if you go there directly as well. Okay, and each one of these tabs is a program. It's a program that'll do one thing. It'll cluster, it'll downsample, whatever it might be. And I think I will spend, since we have a little time here, uh, a few moments just walking you through what the possible plugins you might want to use are, and then we'll go through a high dimensional workflow, uh, choosing an example, pretty much at least one out of each one of the categories. So to begin with, you can get plugins that are intended for either Flojo or SeekGeek. Some are intended for both, and so they would appear in both filters. But if we want to focus on Flojo today, we can click the SeekGeek button off. So SeekGeek, our, our single cell mRNA data, uh, analysis software very similar to Flojo. And then we can have tools for quality control, dimensionality reduction, utilities, clustering, visualization, and well, not many scripts left at this point. So I'll, I'll just mention scripts super briefly to say that plugins are tools that they're just a program that run, they do their thing. Scripts were configurable bits of code that you could go in, I'm gonna turn everything off but the scripts, and you could modify the code to individually work on your own data. Turns out that everybody liked programs that you could just, just run uh, and didn't like creating scripts so much. There is still a script editor in Flojo, but the scripts we had up there are slowly going outdated as no one uses them and we don't update them. So there's one left. Um, anyway, you're, you're free to have it, but there's, there's not a lot of scripting right now. Mostly we have the plugins, which are tools. And so let's take a look at what's available online. There is a, a suite of quality control plugins. Uh, so I think there have been a few posts you know, throughout the last maybe even year or two uh, about using time as a way to check the quality of your data. 
as we generally expect data to be fairly consistent across time as the cells don't organize themselves in any way in the cytometer as you're acquiring it. And so there's two tools here, Flow AI and Flow Clean, that you can use to do some of this checking for consistency across time. And in this, uh, in this talk, I'll demo Flow AI. I, I feel like that's my favorite of the two because it produces really nice reports. Uh, it's very easy to find out why did a particular uh, cell get taken out due to you know, consistency versus time using Flow AI. So I like that one, but Flow Clean has its supporters too. And we will probably look into, as more of these come out, adding them as plugins as well so that you have a full suite of choices. Uh, there's Cytonorm as well, which takes uh, into account differences in time periods. If you collect a reference file, maybe some unstained cells or something like that uh, from each time point that you might collect against, and you can then do some normalization around that. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop on quality control. I will show Flow AI, Flow AI when I actually get some data going here. But I'll also mention that we're going to do, during the MetroFlow online meetings, uh, I put in a talk for doing quality control in Flowjo, where I'll talk about all of these things and a few others. Dimensionality reduction. Okay, so I feel like dimensionality reduction, if you get to really high parameter data, and maybe it doesn't even have to be really high parameter data, maybe even 10 or 12 colors is enough, uh, that dimensionality reduction becomes a necessary tool for just visualization purposes. So what this type of tool does is just provide you with a reduced set of dimensions, generally two, that you can look at high dimensional data and try to understand the entire landscape of phenotypes that you might have, you know, all at once, trying to take into, uh, into representing all of the different parameters that you've measured in, in this one plot and take a look at that. So there's no longer a plugin for TSNE. We've built that directly into Flowjo. Uh, if you have the TSNE plugin, I highly encourage you to try in Flowjo itself by building it directly into the program. We've made it much, much faster. So you've got alternatives here that you could download as dimensionality reduction tools. So TSNE, just to mention briefly now, we'll talk more about it when I open it up. Uh, T distributed stochast stochastic neighbor embedding. Uh, it's attempting in most granular terms to try to find the cells that are neighbors in high dimensional space and create a 2D plot where those, same, where those same cells are still neighbors. They're still near each other in the 2D representation. And TISNI will work by attempting to you know, push together things that are similar and push apart things that are different to make the best representation of the data. So UMAP, as an alternative to that, the authors of UMAP uh, thought that they should really, they would really like to scale your dimensionality reduction outputs so that clusters were shown uh, farther apart if they were more different. And so that's what UMAP attempts to do. It attempts to be TISNI scaled a little so that the, uh, the, rep the distances are representative. Uh, TriMAP, which I'll point to down here, uses uh, you know, three cells at a time, almost like triangulating, uh, to do something very similar to UMAP to produce a dimensionality reduction that uh, preserves distances as relative to how different clusters are, but perhaps does a, maybe a better job at it. We're, TriMap is pretty new. We're still playing with it, but it seems to do a pretty nice job. Uh, TISNI might still be my favorite in that I don't tend to use the dimension out of reduced dimensions, uh, TISNI X and Y or whatever you want to call them, uh, for doing any kind of statistics and whatnot. And I think it does produce the, the nicest representation, the prettiest pictures. So anyway, uh, your call. The other choices up here are FITSNI and EmbedSOM. Uh, FITSNI is fast Fourier transform accelerated TSNE. So it takes the gradient descent algorithm. So TSNE is an iterative process. So between one iteration and the next, we have to make adjustments to the data. This is uh, just gradient descent. And it replaces with a fast Fourier transform based version of that. So we've actually got that built into TSNE in the program as well. So you will likely not need FITSNE. There are some controls that are in the plugin version of that that we haven't put into the built-in one for really fine control. Um, we're going to talk about OpsNE and automating the controls. I don't know that you need them, but it's there just in case you want to give it a whirl and try it out. And then there's EmbedSOM, which is actually significantly different. So SOM stands for self-organizing map. And there are tools here, uh, we'll get to those in clustering, that you can build a map of your data, a self-organized map by showing uh, a grid one cell at a time and adjusting the grid nodes 
to be more similar to the cell that was closest to them. Do that for enough cells and you'll get a map of your data, a self-organized map. You can use the map you build to create dimension out of reduced uh, parameters. And then if you've got that map preserved, at any point in the future, you could use it to create directly comparable uh, reduced dimensions, parameters, uh, that you can then use on future data sets. So it is the only one of these tools that is actually future extensible, that you can, uh, you can use it again in the future without having to rerun all of the data. For UMAP, FITSNE, TriMAP, TSNE, all of those tools, they're going to find pretty much the exact same populations every time you run it, but there's no reason that the T cells will be pulled upward and the B cells downward when it tries to separate out these populations. It might do the reverse the next time it runs it, just depending on where it starts, and what the initialization is. And so it gets a little harder to directly compare those populations, especially using you know, graphics or, or gates that are dependent on graphics and so forth. So it's nice to run anything that you're gonna compare all at once, if you're going to do UMAP or TriMAP or TSNE. Uh, with EmbedSOM, you don't have to do that. You can go forward extensible with this. I will say that the pictures are fairly representative though. EmbedSOM, because then it is not doing the best job it can on this specific data set every time you run it, it's doing the best job it did on the first set that you used to model it, you will get messier results. So it's, it's a weighing process of what's going to be most important to you. If you want to save some time going forward, embed some might be a good choice. If you want to get the best looking map you can, TST might be the best choice. If you want the best looking map you can, and you want the distances to be indicative of how different they are, maybe TriMap is the best choice at that point. So it depends on what you need. I'll mention I sell R is here as well. So that's going to show up in a lot of these categories because it's actually a complete pipeline that does 3D plots, dimension I reduction, unsupervised clustering, differential expression, and more. Uh, I'll say, not all of the choices, like the dimensionality reduction here, I think the T's need built into flow to is much better than the pipeline version that ISOR has here. And so you might not want to use the whole pipeline. There is an option just to do the interactive 3D plots only. And so if you want to use this tool to make images that look sort of like that, you can do so. Okay, switching to, let's jump to clustering. I'll come back to utility since I was just talking about self-organizing maps. So clustering is just a means of figuring out what cells are similar to each other using math, as opposed to hand-drawn gates. Uh, there's a number of options here, uh, different, different choices for different purposes. So I just mentioned SOM, self-organizing maps. And so FlowSOM then takes the self-organizing map that can be built and clusters it. So if you start with some number of nodes, you can cluster them into however many clusters you tell it to find. So the pluses for FlowSOM is that it's really fast. It's, uh, it's a very effective, efficient way to do clustering. Uh, it produces really nice graphics. This is representative here of a minimal spanning tree, a very similar graphic to those used by Spade, which was probably the best part of Spade. Uh, FlowSOM uses them as well. I really like it as a way to visualize a clustering result. Uh, it's forward extensible, just like EmbedSOM is forward extensible for applying dimensionality reduction. FlowSOM is forward extensible for applying clustering results if you want to compare some future data set back directly to one that you ran in the past. So there's a lot to like about FlowSOM. It's one of, it's perhaps my favorite of the clustering algorithms and maybe the one, yeah, the one that I'll show today. We'll use, we'll use FlowSOM to cluster this data that I'm going to look at. So the downside of FlowSOM is that you have to tell it how many clusters to find as the output. Well, one mitigating factor there is that it produces a lot of outputs and I'll show you how to look for those outputs to try to estimate how many clusters there are. And in part because it's so fast, it's not a big deal if you run it and decide, you know what, one more cluster would have really been worth having and to try it again. And so we'll talk through that. Phenograph and XShift are two tools that will automatically estimate the number of clusters for you. So they're really useful for that. If you're looking at the data and you say, I want this to be completely unbiased by my, by my input, one of those are the best. Uh, both of them will basically use two stages to try to identify local neighborhoods of cells to say this group of cells seem the same and then basically zoom out, look at the big picture and decides which neighborhoods should then be bundled together because in the big picture, they're really close to each other compared to other neighborhoods. And so it'll do, it'll do the mode seeking in that manner. And so those are really nice options as well. And I believe Phenograph, uh, when all is said and done, if you trust expert hand gating as the, as the gold standard, 
is actually probably the algorithm that does the best job, at least in our experience, of matching what a user might do by hand gating. You know, if you don't think that's the gold standard, then you know, so much for that. But that's, a, and that's, that's okay too. It's an option you've got. Uh, flow means is one of the original clustering algorithms that people put up there. It's potentially one of the fastest and it works really, really well uh, if your data happens to be more or less perfectly circular. So if you've got perfectly circular data, flow means is the way to go. If not, maybe one of the other three. There's ICLR again. Uh, there is a K finder tool here that helps you to estimate K, the number of clusters in a data set. We found so far that the particular K finder we're using here works much, much better for SeatGeek on you know, a sparse matrix, which tends to be our mRNA data more so than flow data. I don't recommend this tool that for that reason, for flow data, I think we will put up a different K finder algorithm using a different statistic for flow. Two other options that you've got, uh, Astrolabe import. So Astrolabe is a different company uh, run by Elad. There's actually a webinar, I'll point to that one too. All right, I'm pump, pumping up our webinars. Our webinars where Elad and I did one together on showing using Astrolabe and Flojo together. Uh, what his tool does effectively is run FlowSum on your data, but then he maintains a database so that when you pop out results, his tool can see if your cells were positive for this, that, or the other thing and give it a biological name automatically, which then can be imported into Flojo and you can use Tisney and other visualization techniques to explore the outputs there. Uh, so this is the one plugin that is not completely free and that Astrolabe is somebody else's company and they are a for pay service. So you would have to, you have to pay Elad for his services, for his tools to use it. But if you already have that or decide you want to get it, then using it in Flojo is free. Okay. And there's a chat from Kathy to reach out if you're at MSKCC to that. And then we've also put up an SVM here, a support vector machine. So unlike the rest of the clustering algorithms, which are unsupervised, go help me figure out how to divide up the data. Support vector machines are used uh, in the context of training data on some exemplars and then applying whatever decision boundaries it finds to future data sets. So it's a, it's a choice basically to extend some kind of gating routine that you can find using exemplar data. All right, utilities. And I'm keeping an eye on the chat just to see if other questions pop in as well. All right, but I know this is the summary. This is the summary portion of the talk. Okay, utilities, sort of the miscellaneous category. Uh, there is a downsampling tool, so you can downsample at any point if you want to give a algorithm a try on a smaller data set. I will say we have spent a, a fairly large amount of time attempting to make all our algorithms fast enough so that you don't have to downsample. That's our goal. Our goal is that if you've got data that potentially has some you know, really rare population that you don't want to risk downsampling out that you can run a big file on our Tisney program and make it happen and see results, you know, in a relatively reasonable amount of time. Uh, I'll show several hundred thousand events being run in a couple of minutes. Uh, you can run up to several hundreds of thousands of events over the course of hours. So it's just a matter of what you would like to, what you'd like to do. So, so anyway. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed it's fast enough for you and that you can run it on big, big data sets. Okay, there's a violin and box plot uh, tool that allows you just to make some additional graphics. There's HyperFinder. HyperFinder is a really neat tool that will go in and recapitulate some population you found with you know, polygon gates and you can pick a limited number of polygon gates. The idea being that we you know some sorting tools like Diva, for example, uh, will limit you to say eight polygon gates to be able to sort on. What if you've clustered your data and you found that this population is really interesting and you want to sort it? Or what if you've taken 30 manual gates to find the population? You can run HyperFinder and it will do its best to recapitulate whatever population it is that you found, however you've done it, in the number of gates you specify. That can then be sent back to Diva for sorting. So I really like that tool and that it takes a little bit of this computational biology that we espouse and brings it back to the lab bench. Okay, there's an indexed sort tool. Let's see. Question from Joel, would you use downsampled of cleaned data all start with the same amount of events? Yeah, Joel, that's a, that's a reasonable use of downsample. If you just wanna make sure that you've got the same number of events, you can do so. Um, it's also about the same as if you just say, put a range gate on a, uh, on, on like an event number parameter or something like that. Yeah, 
that's that's a reasonable use of that. Okay, uh, there's a CBA tool. Uh, we are actively working on that tool right now. It is being updated uh, semi-regularly just to add some kits to it uh, to make it more functional. Uh, let's see, so some of our, our, our uh, QC stuff also falls into the category of utility. One that I'd really like to highlight is the plugin wizard. So not all these plugins are written by you know, us at Blojo. In fact, probably only half of them are. The other half are by folks in academia or industry who are doing work on computational analysis of flow data and have come up with some kind of algorithm that they think is worth sharing with everybody. And if you post it here, anybody can have it. So they're all free. Uh, and so a lot of these algorithms were written by somebody working in R. Uh, R is an open source programming language that uh, anybody can download for free and use, uh, assuming you know, you've got permission from your company to download stuff to your computer. So R is available to all. And so there's a lot of these that are just R tools packaged up to work in Flojo. And so you'll have to have R, and you might have to download a library um, into R so that it has all the tools it needs. And that can be challenging, especially handling updates, R updates, a plugin updates, Flojo updates, everything updates in the world of software. And so what the plugin wizard's designed to do is take all the pain out of making sure you've got everything R-related installed and all your updates taken care of and so forth. And I'll, I'll show you how to use this one as well. I think this is a really nice plugin. It is a plugin, so you still have to download it and install it, and we'll talk about that in a sec, uh, how to get these things. But I think it'll help with everything R-related thereafter. Okay, and there are a few of these we could have seen before, other than there is a calibration tool built into the utilities. So last, visualization. Uh, I think most of these will have popped up before with the exception of Cluster Explorer, uh, another tool that I'll demo. I really like this one. It's just a tool that will take, if you've done a uh, clustering result, it will show you clusters uh, across a heat map, across a line chart, so that you can try to figure out what they are. And if you've also run something like Tisney or, or another dimensionality reduction tool, it can also import your Tisney plot and give you an interactive way to mouse around your Tisney plot and see what each one of the regions are by cluster. And so that's a cool one. Okay, for any of these plugins, and let's pick Flowsom because that is one that was written in R originally. If you're interested, click on the plugin. It'll give you a description. Okay. It will tell you what the current version is, how many people are using this particular tool. Uh, so a larger number implies that it's one that is more popular, uh, that has been well received. It also means it's one that's been up on the exchange longer. So take that with a grain of salt if something looks like it's brand new. Uh, if you want it, click the download button. All right, so we get a zip file. I'll drop that on my desktop. And I'll mention that if it was something that was you know, not written by us, that was generally published, if you hit citation, you can see the paper. All right, so this is Sophie Van Gassens. Double-clicking the zip file opens it up. And inside each one of the folders, uh, you'll have a jar file. And that is the actual program. And you'll have a how-to PDF. The rest of it, you know, just a backup and a necessary license file. The jar file, you're going to just take, drag and drop to wherever you want to keep your plugins. Uh, I have mine just in my applications folder in a cleverly named folder called plugins. So there's all my jar files. So if I didn't already have Flowsum, I would drag it and drop it in here. In Flojo, in the preferences, the heart right here, and diagnostics, you have to click scan for plugins and tell us what folder you picked. So there's my applications slash plugins. Cool. Okay, and then the how to, will give you instructions on how to install it. So right here, it also says, drag your jar file into a folder, tell us where it is. If it's a plugin that required R, it will give you the code that you can copy and paste. So I could control C, control V, open up R and just paste it in uh, to get all the necessary libraries. So I need Flowcore, Flowsum, and P Heatmap to make Flowsum do its thing. I could just copy and paste it into R. I will also show you the plugin wizard approach to this in a moment. And then it'll give you instructions on how to run, how to run that plugin. This one particularly does most of its instructions via a video, ones that we didn't make a video for. Uh, there's a little more text involved. So you'll notice the other part there, there's a box here in red that says, tell us what your R path is. 
So same spot here, preferences and diagnostics. If you are going to use one of the R-based plugins, you'll need R on your computer, and then you have to tell us where it is. Uh, a little trick, if you happen to be a Mac user, you can go to your utilities, you can go to your terminal, you can type which R, and just copy paste whatever pops out if you've installed R. That is where R lives on your computer. Okay, so every time you start Flojo, we look in that folder, wherever you've pointed, and whatever jar files you have in there, we populate into this plugins list. Let's see, I can move this flow song to the trash. I already have it. Okay, cool. So the other one, the other means of getting those that I was gonna show was using the wizard. So we can go plugins and I will find the plugin wizard. And there are two types of plugins, a workspace plugin, something that just runs on the whole workspace. And so there's a few of these kind of things. Uh, the rest are population dependent. And so you have to have clicked on a population to ungray it. So I clicked on a population, these are all ungray. I click plugin wizard. What the plugin wizard has is a place to go get R. And so it'll figure out if you're on a Mac or PC and go get the appropriate version of R. I, sorry, the warning here is disconnected, it appears. Uh, it always just tells you R is not installed. I claim I have R. Uh, here's a spot to set the R path. So if you haven't done so yet, you can do it right there. Here's a spot where you can check to auto install the R packages required for every, every plugin as of January. Uh, we'll update this soon. Just check that box. And that bit where I had to go in and copy paste from FlowSOM a few R packages, I can skip that. Okay, where are you going to keep the plugins? So you've probably already had to do this if you're working the plugin wizard, but it'll show you guess, in case you change it perhaps. There's a what's new button, click that and you'll get this window pops up telling you the list of plugins, what the latest version is and what the installed version is. So I have my SeatGeek plugins in a separate spot so I don't have KFinder or Lex, my phenograph is up to date and you can scroll down and say, okay, am I all up to date? Oh, it looks like I don't have the latest embed song. So I could click the 1.1 button and if I do so, it'll go right to the exchange and start downloading embed song for me. And so I can always stay up to date. Okay, say okay and you can step out of the plugin wizard. So that can go a long way to keeping you updated and take a lot of the worry and difficulty out of installing these plugins. Okay, thank you for visiting, visiting the plugin wizard today. Well, you're welcome plugin wizard. Okay, so that was just how to get a plugin. I figured I had to start there if I'm about to go use a whole bunch of plugins to analyze this data. So voila, now moving into the data. Okay, so it is a 40 color experiment um, with all sorts of phenotypes that are embedded in this thing and a really nice use case for going high dimensional. Um, so I will start with that when you get this many parameters, perhaps doing some data QC is even more important than ever in that it's easy to miss artifacts and whatnot across so many parameters. So one tool that's built into Flojo that you can use is just to hit the check sample quality button. And that will color the circle next to the samples with a color somewhere between green for good, red for bad. So the, the coloring is uh, green, blue, yellow, pink, red. So it turns out we've got some middle of the road samples that get the yellow coloring. You can right click on any sample and hit inspect. And it's gonna give you, well again, all the keywords, the comp matrix, the scaling parameters, but right here, graphs of the median of each parameter versus time where the X axis is always time, the listed parameter is then Taken here, we show the M of five of a, of a tenth of a second or so of collection. We look for consistency. There's a couple parameters that are a little bit messy, and we can see perhaps why this got a yellow label. We could maybe go to the time parameter and do some hand gaming to try to get the, the good spots out of it. But the higher you get in the number of parameters, the more you would like to automate that. And then that whole sort of you know, okay, it's yellow. What exactly does yellow mean is a little bit unsatisfying. And so I really like using some of those data QC algorithms that I was showing. And particularly, again, I mentioned FlowSOM. So I'm going to go to the workspace, the plugins, and I'm going to, sorry, did I say FlowSOM? Flow AI, I am gonna show FlowSOM, but Flow AI is the cleanup one. Flow AI, and click that. Okay, so I'm running it on this sample. Uh, by default, all the parameters get selected that are not 
you know, scatters and so forth. We only need one version, comp or uncomped. I prefer it on the uncomped. I believe it doesn't matter too much and that we're just looking for consistency in time, but we don't want comp to be, you know, to play a, play a factor in this just in case it's bad. There are three different checks this thing will run. Uh, it'll check the dynamic range, the signal acquisition stability, and the flow rate. You can choose to run one, two, or all three. I tend to just run all checks. You've got a couple of choices for how you can tune this thing. FR is the flow rate. And so you can set a significance level that it's looking for, uh, 0.01. You could go up to maybe 0.05, make it a little less stringent if you'd like. Whatevs. Uh, the number of seconds that it's going to look at. Uh, so this is a tenth of a second we'll look at as intervals to check on the flow rate. That seems fine as a default. Uh, the change points deal with the signal stability. Anytime you see a big shift in the signal, that would be a change point. And the bigger the change point, uh, the more likely we are to say that something has actually gone wrong in the acquisition at this point, and we would like to ignore the data that comes either before or after that change point. And we'll just generally make the guess that we want the bigger portion and keep it. The change point penalty, the bigger you set this, and this is maybe, maybe not, not obvious, the bigger you set it, the less penalty is involved in finding a change point. So the, the, the more forgiving the data is. We've got 200 set in there as the default, which was the recommendation of the original authors. Uh, the original authors of this algorithm have decided since that 500 is probably the better default. I will make that change here right now and be a little less stringent on the data. The maximum number of change points is just a way that you can limit how many divisions we put in your data. Um, you can sit, leave it at three. I think that's fine. Uh, you could set it for more. You know, most data, it's going to find one or none. And so it's, it's, it's up to you what you want to set that max as. I don't know that that's super critical. You can check the dynamic range, whether it's both above uh, or below the maximum detectable range on your cytometer. Uh, that just means anything that was going to be totally off scale, that was just going to be placed in the top bin because, well, we don't know how far off scale it was going to be, gets taken out. And same thing for the low end. Anything that was below the lowest amount we could measure just gets taken out. So I like hitting both there. I like hitting the remove outliers checkbox that will look through your signal stability. And if you've got a spot where, for whatever reason, your signal surged, and a change point occurs, and we don't want to take everything out after it. If it was just a blip, then we can just say, let's, let's treat that as an outlier, remove that small spot perhaps, and, uh, and keep the rest of the data that came after that. Um, so the flow rate, uh, you can uh, use that, just it'll do, it's a two-part flow rate that Flow AI does, a, a trend, and also oscillations. I just very much recommend keeping that on, so we'll actually we'll look at both parts of it. The other bit here that I think is a nice thing to always have on is the save the R script and output messages. If you click that on, uh, it will keep your R script. And if anything goes wrong when you run this, everything that happened in R, since this one's based in R, will be written into that script. And if you are feeling a little uh, R capable, you can open it up and see what's, what's missing, what's went, went wrong, um, you know, whatever it is. And if you're not, then if you write into our tech support, available at flowjo at bd.com, uh, they might say, well, send us that R script and we can look at it and tell you what happened and why it didn't work or whatever the problem was. And so that's worth having, I think. So we'll hit OK. All right. Uh, I have this saved as MSK series, et cetera. I have a folder with the same name. When you run a, pl uh, a plugin, you can go in and see uh, all of the outputs that that plugin has in the folder of the same name. Whoops, wrong one. And so this is working right now on this D6 file. What happened there? Oh, that's exciting. And it is going to calculate good events and bad events. <clears throat> and just set them up as gates. And so you can see it's creating a folder uh, for each file that it looks at. And then when it finishes, I'm guessing if you try to open the file in the middle of running, it throws an error at you. Uh, it'll create this little web page as a report for what it did. So here's good events, bad events, it kept 89% of the events here. Uh, we could go to the layout editor if we want it. Let's hit plus here. We could throw in good events versus bad events. 
and perhaps make this axis time. Okay, so it looks like it chopped off a bit here at the end of D7. And we could say, well, interesting. So why did that happen? And if we want it, then we could go into the output report and check out exactly what Flow AI has done. Okay, so here's the three parts of the check that I was describing. Here's the flow rate. So it's taking one tenth of a second intervals and it's finding every spot that was outside of like a standard deviation or so. And you'll see where the, the green circles are for high, for low, and a little bit there at the end. And just taking out one tenth of a second intervals. It then is looking at the signal stability here. And it's looking for anywhere where there's a change point. So one at the very beginning that didn't affect the data too much. Cool. And then it's looking for down here, the dynamic range, and checking for any events that were on the upper or lower bound and taking those out. So we've got each of those checks built in. And apparently we ran into some trouble right there at the end of acquisition where it seems to have spiked up. And then we took out those events. And so the other thing we can do with this tool is you can grab it and take it to the entire group. So I can do this. And it's just going to perform Flow AI on every one of the files in this group. Uh, it takes roughly, you know, it took 25 seconds or so uh, to do one of these samples that had, what was it, 140,000 events times 40 parameters. Um, I timed this earlier. We have to wait about a minute and 20 seconds for it to run on all six of these samples. So you can imagine coming in, just applying it to your group and saying something defective. Well, let me check the weather for a minute and then I'll have my data QC'd up and ready to use. Okay, so we're going through. We're hitting up each one of these samples. I made sure uh, there were a couple extra samples to choose from. I made sure I had at least a few in here uh, that showed some kind of issue so that I could, uh, I could highlight uh, what Flow AI is looking for. And I think we want to do, we want to check out D11, for example. All right, D11. Okay, so here's one that both had a big spike at the end. And then we find right about here in the data, there's a change point. And so in this data, then it just leaves out that front chunk. It says right there at about, you know, 60, 60 bins in or so, there's a big spike across many of the parameters. And so it leaves that chunk out. And that's why we lose you know, some percent of our events. You know, something's going on with six. I don't know what I did to that one, but it's just not working here with Flow AI. So we'll, we'll leave that one go for now and I'll figure it out later. I did a little concatenating and exploiting, just trying out some stuff in this data. Probably just brought in the concatenated or some version of the parameter. Okay. So anyway, so most of these files, you know, are going to end up being pretty good. It was a yellow file, so we do expect Flow AI to take, you know, some events out of every one of them. Okay, and it looks like we're down to the last one. Cool or less two. Okay, uh, question on, do I use the same flow AI settings for mass cytometry data? Uh, hmm, good question. So we still would, would do the same sample stability. That would make sense. We would still do the same dynamic range. Uh, I think I'm not an expert enough on mass cytometry to know if we would expect flow rate to be quite as even as flow cytometry. So yeah, that one I'd want to, you know, I'd want a mass cytometry expert to say, should I perhaps look at, if you, if you set the time chunks uh, to be a little more generous, uh, that would be, that would take, that would be less sensitive to differences in time of flight perhaps, which makes more sense or which is more uh, valuable in mass cytometry. Uh, question from Lucy Brown, and do I run it on comp tubes as well? I generally don't. I guess it depends on how many events you have, but with the comp tubes, 
I'm already going to do a fairly tight cleanup gate on some positives and negatives, uh, but even before that on just cells of a particular size and complexity to try to use that as a cleanup gate uh, upstream. And so by already taking a really small subset generally of my data of the cleanest, nicest data, um, I feel like I'll have probably done pretty well with that. And then I also am only gonna use that to calculate MFI. There's also the consideration of you need to have at least 500 events to call something a peak in Flojo, and I don't wanna somehow uh, take out too many events that I don't have enough to call in the peak. So I, I don't, you, know, you can, uh, it maybe would help your compensation a tiny bit, uh, probably, not, probably not a valuable amount of time. Okay, uh, back over here. Uh, the next thing that I'm gonna do with this is I'm gonna go delete the Flow AI icon. Okay, a lot of our plugins are set up to automatically recalculate if you change some gates. And uh, if you, you know, have used Flow AI, and you figure out the good events, that's pretty much the events you wanna work on from there on out. And so I don't ever really wanna recalculate that one. And so I'm just gonna delete it so it doesn't do any recalculating. Oh yeah, question, do you use only Flow AI good events for analysis? That's what I'm gonna do, yep. And so this is some pretty high dimensional data. I am going to bring in uh, some conventional gates that I am going to use for, I'm just gonna take D6 out of the analysis since I won't have a good events gate. We'll go on from here on five. Um, I wanna use some conventional gates for comparison. We wanna do this analysis high D. I'm gonna use a bunch of TISNI and clustering and so forth to do it, but I wanna just compare to some traditional analysis. I'm just gonna go to file. I'm going to apply a template. I'm gonna grab off my desktop. Do, 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 do. Where is my template? in that list. No, oh, it's in the folder. There it is, template. Okay, so I put a few gates on to identify um, dendritic cells, lymphocytes, monocytes, bunch of, bunch of subsets. Uh, the gating done by my friend Mike who collected the data. Thank you for that. And then since we did do uh, Flow AI and have these Flow AI good events, I'm gonna drag that up to the group. Okay, so I've got the Flow AI good events gate now set on all these samples. So that's going to work in that what this actually is, is a derived parameter that Flow AI created, just called Flow AI. Uh, and it basically just gives each cell or each event uh, a one or a two, or in this case, a 2000 and a 6000 uh, for good or bad. And then the flow AI event gate is really just a histogram gate here, of a, the, the range that includes the good or the bad. So since each cell has been classified as good or bad, the flow AI good event gate is actually already the same on every one of these files. So I can drag it to the group with no issues. And then I can drag the singlets gate and drop it onto flow AI good events. And do that for the whole group. And then I've got all my gating now applied to just the good events. And if I do that, and I actually don't need the second single gate, I can take that off. Okay, cool. So there's that. I've got some analysis now on all of the files that I can compare to if I want. I wanna get down to the live population. All right, so I've got this huge data set. And how do I visualize that? Well, I think first of all, just having a plot that allows me to really look at the data. It's such complex data. It would take a ton of graphs to really examine it. And so I want a TISNY plot now, just to see what, what's in all this data. And so let's get to that. Uh, first, there's a question, did I drag the template into the analysis? At sort of kind of melody, I used the apply template button here out of the file menu that just goes and finds a template and then matches it up with the data that I've got going already in a workspace that if I've done some things, in this case, Ranflow AI, I can incorporate that and the things that win the template into one workspace in the middle of, in the middle of working on it. At, you know, dragging it is a, is a similar way, or you can uh, start with the template and drag new data into it. A few ways to work with the template, but I use the apply template in this case. Okay, so let's talk about, say, you know, just two different ways to do Disney. One is perhaps I just want to visualize the sample. Uh, next, we'll do comparisons. But first, I just want to visualize the sample. 
I want to maybe do some clustering on it and I want to see if those clustering results are good, etc. So I'm just going to grab the live population here. I'm going to go back to the workspace tab and hit TSD. Okay, so the steps you have to do are select the parameters you want, generally going to be all of them, and here I'm just going to use all the compensated. Okay, that looks fine. Uh, all right. And then I can either choose my learning configuration to be auto, opsni, or manual. And then I can set perhaps iterations, perplexity, learning rate. I can choose what my KNN algorithm is, and I can choose my gradient descent. So I'm going to choose opsni, approximate, annoy, and FFT interpolation, and hit run. Uh, so when I just gave a dry run at this data, it took two minutes and 50 seconds to run this TISNY. So I want to get it started so that I don't run it and we sit here quietly. And then I'll tell you what those three choices were while that's running. So the learning configuration, OPSNI or manual, uh, comes down to there's a handful of things uh, that TISNY has to adjust. One of them is the, uh, the early exaggeration phase. So there's a, there's a part of TISNY where it tries to push together things that are similar. And then the next stage, once early exaggeration ends, is pushing apart things that are dissimilar. And then there's how many iterations should you run? You know, the more you run, generally the better, but at some point it'll stop getting better. It'll be as good as it can. And then when do you stop? Uh, and so these things you could attempt to manually set the adjustables, the tunables on that, or you could click the Opsni button. And what Opsni is going to do is measure the goodness metric for TISNY, which is a kolbeck liebler divergence, uh, basically a measure of how close is the 2D map to the high D map in terms of keeping neighbors similar. And it's going to look, look at that metric. And so while early exaggeration is running, we're pushing things closer, we can see how well we're doing. And at the point where we stop getting better, it can make the switch. So we can run for as long as it needs to run, as opposed to guessing at what we estimate a good time would be and perhaps start, you know, just stopping too soon and not doing a good early exaggeration or running too long and wasting your time. Uh, it can also then just, when you get to the, to the end and the algorithm has stopped improving, you can just stop. So we've set a thousand as the iterations. If you do the auto, it'll use that as a max. So it's at 550 now. If it gets to 600 and it's not getting any better, it'll just stop. And so that's a nice time saver at the end as well. So I really highly recommend the Opsni algorithm uh, it was created by Annabelle Kina. Uh, the reference is right there in, the, in the, the menu there in Flojo that you can get it and read it if you want to. But really, it's a matter of actually using the data to let it tell you how long Tisney should run for. And the, uh, you know, the learning rate is set by the number of events that you've got and just letting the machine uh, do its part, calculating it by looking at the data as opposed to automatic. You know, oh, sorry, it's done already. I talked too slow. Um, as opposed to trying to guess at what the settings are. So I highly recommend using Opsi. I think it's a great way to go. Uh, the other two choices, and I can actually just pull up, oops, sorry, not plugging anymore. I can pull up the Tuesday platform again just to point at them. Uh, KNN, so KNN stands for K nearest neighbors. Again, Tisney is attempting to figure out who are the neighbors at, uh, you know, at, the, uh, at the highest level in high dimensional space and make sure that we've got the same neighbors at lowest at the, the 2D representation. And so at some point, we actually do have to measure the distance between the cells. You could do that exact. So that's what the vantage point tree is. Or you could do approximate it using ANOI. So ANOI is the same algorithm that you use in um, Spotify. That's what it is, the music software uh, that tries to figure out what song to play next for you. <laughs> And what it's going to do is some approximation, like after it's done a few of the calculations, if it says, well, I'm the neighbor with, you know, A and B, uh, both, then perhaps A and B are also neighbors with each other. And doing that, it can speed up the process. It is an approximation. It won't do quite as good as exact most of the time, but in my experience, I can't tell the difference between them and it's much faster. So I tend to choose annoy. Let's take a look at the chat. I think a few questions came in. Uh, hi, do you keep the viability parameter in the TSNE calculation from the Sandrine? You know what? I did and I didn't need to. I uh, specifically went to the point where uh, I had live cells. Uh, you know, dead cells are crazy. We'd like to get them out of, uh, of TSNE plots and so forth because they will have 
a fairly random smattering of positives, generally positive for many, 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 many things. They'll look like a lot of populations. They'll make your data much uglier and harder to deal with. And so having taken them out already, I could have looked and scrolled through this list and found our live dead discriminant and deselected it, that would have been smarter. Uh, when you add parameters to a TISNY plot or a clustering algorithm for that matter, that, uh, you know, that are just the same for all, all of the cells because you gated them to be live, they don't really have any more information, they make every cell look a little more similar and make your TISNY plot a little bit worse. I will assume that it hasn't mattered too much in this data, I've got so many parameters going on here, but if I was doing my best analysis, I would have taken that out, great question. And from Kathy Daniels, when you're kind of you clean up debris, dead cells, and aggregates of cells before doing analysis, yes. Uh, those kind of cleanups, absolutely. Again, for the same reason you want to take out the dead, and that's part of your question as well. Uh, so, yeah, I would say you know, get rid of all, of all of that stuff ahead of time, which I think I did with the singlets, a live gate, and my good event, bad event gate using Flow AI uh, to help just take out stuff that's going to look like many other cell types without really being so. Okay. Cool. Uh, last part is the gradient algorithm. Uh, there's Barnes Hutt and Fast Fourier. Uh, they're both just trying to figure out how big a change to make from one iteration to the next Fast Fourier runs faster. I use that one. That's all. That's about all there is to that. If you choose it uh, and you want to know the exact on the math, you can get the paper here. This one's an intense read. Uh, feel free. But uh, I think it really just comes down to it is faster. And I don't think you give up anything. So I, I, I personally always pick Fast Fourier. Okay, so you've got this Tisney plot now. Sweet. Uh, what do all these islands mean? I don't know. They're just listed in, you know, Tisney 1 and 2, basically. Uh, if you want to do a little bit of exploring, you can turn on the color axis, and then you can map any parameter that you want on top of it. Okay, so there's the RA positives and so forth. All right, you can go to the layout editor. I'm going to hit another plus here. Just drag in that population. You can right click on this plot, go to multigraph overlays, and there is a multigraph color mapping choice where if you'd like to pick one or many different parameters that you'd like to see lit up to see, oops, I'm in non-compensated ones. Ha, let's do the compensated ones. Uh, one or more parameters that you'd like to see lit up on this map in terms of where the cells that express them are. Hit that button. You'll get a TISNY map then with each of those parameters heat mapped. And I think one other bit that is worth pointing out on just controls for this is that I'm going to make a duplicate of that plot. I'm going to put one of these other parameters on the axis, let's see, cd 5 ra how about? So our heat map color scheme just goes from left edge to right edge. Anything out here will be red, anything over here will be blue. At the moment, we've got a whole lot of green because a lot of this is just in that, you know, that minimal range there. We figured that is the best way to do it. We don't want to just make it that the brightest cells, wherever they are, get the brightest color. Uh, and that you figure you could then gate a population, get all CD3 positives and have them come up with a rainbow of CD3 colors from brightest to dimmest. So that does then imply that if you hit the T button, customize the axis, since it is using you know, the full range there, if you stretch the data out to fill the screen space a little more, just showing a little extra space or showing a little less space in this case, you can actually get a more differentiated color map. That is how we're doing the color mapping. We figure in future versions, we'll come up with a variety of ways to scale that and, and set a consistent scale and so forth. But I think for the time being, that is, that is, that is okay there, that you can control you know, exactly how much you want to see. Okay, so now we've got a TISNY, and we can use that for visualization. I have an idea that there are, I don't know, 20 clusters in this data perhaps, and we want to find out what they are. We want to divide them up. Let's use the clustering tool. Okay, I'm gonna to go to plugins. I am a big fan of FlowSOM myself. I'm gonna use FlowSOM. Same deal here with the Tisney. You can feed it and it remembered in the last menu that I left out live dead. So now we've got that left out. Yay, thank you algorithm for being, you know, having a memory, you know, mine is, mine is not as good. <laughs> okay, we've got all the, all the parameters selected by default. 
So you could do that. You could deselect some to create uh, subsets if you want of parameters that you want to use for this clustering. Since I'm just feeding the whole live population to it, I might feed all of them in at this point. If I was going to, you know, maybe, I think what this clustering is going to do is probably pick out the biggest populations, the best, and it may do okay at figuring out what the subsets are, but I'll point out that Tisney, dimension eye reduction, clustering albums, and so forth, will take the full range of whatever you've presented and make the most different things look the most different. So in this case, if T cells and B cells and dendritic cells are all in the same dead data set, then those things will look far apart, but say small differences, different types of T cells are kind of gonna get pushed together because we're trying to explore a much larger space if you really want to use these tools to find subpopulations then it might be worth breaking out, we can do this next, breaking out a particular you know, phenotype that was fairly easy to gate by hand. I just grabbed all my C3D positives or something like that, and then also do subclustering there. You could also use clustering recursively. You could ask it to go through and find the large populations running at once, and then pick a particular cluster and run clustering on that cluster to see if it finds any more subpopulations uh, giving that input. So here, I'm just gonna feed it the works. I'm gonna say, show me everything that's in my live minus the live dead since they're live. Okay, flow sum's extensible. Uh, so there's an apply on map choice. If I had run flow sum in this workspace already, I would have another choice here. I haven't yet, so it's still none, but we could come back and look at that if we want. The number of meta clusters is the final number of clusters that I want to find by eyeballing 20-ish. Let's pick that and then I'll talk you through looking at some of the outputs of flow sum to see if that was a good choice. The sum grid size, so this is gonna make width by height a 10 by 10 grid, so 100 nodes that will start as a grid and then we'll show it one cell at a time for 121,000 cells. And each time we show it a cell, we'll adjust the node to be a little, whatever node is closest to that cell when plotted on the grid, we will then end up mapping the data by showing it all the cells and letting each node move one at a time as the cells get shown to it. You can visualize this thing as a minimal spanning tree. Really like the minimal spanning tree, love it. Uh, we'll use that one. But you could also do Tisney or you could do a grid. I feel like we do a better Tisney and the grid is dull. So I tend to pick minimal spanning tree. Um, you can plot a heat map of a particular channel. You could also do all as a pie chart. This is gonna be nutty to unusable because I've given it 40. If you pick a smaller subset, it'll be easier to read the pies. We can probably pick a smaller subset when we then go in and look at, say, a subset of this large, large data set and do a better job examining the pies. You can fix the node size or not. And if you fix it, all the nodes are the same size. They're nice, they're big, they're easy to read. If you leave it unchecked, you will get smaller nodes when there are fewer cells ascribed to a cluster, bigger cells when there are more. I like leaving it unchecked, your call. There is a save the R script and output messages for trouble. I'll say, okay, we'll let this run. In, the, uh, in the, the trial run through I gave it, it took about 58 seconds to run flow sum, so that's what I'll be expecting. We can also go look in our folder again, close up flow AI, notice that we've now got a flow sum folder and it's starting to populate with files as flow sum does its bit and starts producing outputs. Uh, sip some coffee break. Assume that that is just about done because I see pretty much all of the output files have been created. And now it's just bringing the clusters back into Flojo. And there we go. Okay, so let's, let's start here with the outputs that we have in our output folder and then we'll really take the deep dive in Flojo. Okay, so first off, you've got all these PDFs and PNGs and they're divided up into CL, HM, labels, labels, et cetera, MFIs, and then POP of all the same. POP stands for populations. We set in 20 populations is how many we'd like to see at the end. Uh, CL is the clusters, that 100 nodes you start with. So for example, if we go to POP heat map, here we go. Here are the 20 clusters and what they're positive for. Okay, so, all right, there we go, six through 19. You can read this since there's a dendrogram created that puts the similar clusters near each other, for example. Uh, actually, six is a bit of an outlier. It looks very different from most everything, 
but then one and two are very similar and the most similar to population six. And then it's heat mapped for what they are most positive for. So for example, this six really stood out perhaps because it had the most uh, BUV 563. The parameter label was left off here. Yeah, usually those will show as well. Probably something about how these files are recorded. But anyway, you get a range of how these looked, what they are, and how they are different. Cool. So that's the populations one, exploring what you actually got. The cluster one, and let's find cluster heat map, is going to be crazy looking. You're going to look at this and say, well, what the heck good is that? So that's the 100 initial nodes broken down by heat map and similarity. Uh, so what I think this is good for is glancing at the dendrogram at the 100 node level and saying, well, how many clusters did I really have? The length of the line in a dendrogram tells you how similar things were. So where there's a big line, those were pretty different. Where there's a small line, they were pretty similar. So we could glance at this, and depending on how fine a resolution went, we might say, well, that looks like that could all be one cluster in two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, something like that. So maybe I should have gone with 21, maybe 22 to give it a little bit of a, you know, a, a place to put some outlier clusters. I didn't look too carefully to see if there was like a giant line separating one, one node all by itself. It didn't look like there was at a glance. So just to say, that won't be an exact number that you will glance at that, but you'll say, you know what, the answer was probably somewhere between 19 and 23. You know, it wasn't 50, it wasn't 100. And so that's a, I think that's a nice way to hone in on the proper number of clusters. It looks like 20 was a reasonably good guess. It's almost like I did this once before and then put in a guess based on that. Or that I glanced at the TSNI plot and had some idea of how many should be in there. So anyway, that's what I think those heat maps are nice for. Uh, the labels will help particularly at the pop level. If at some point we've got 20 clusters and I'll show them in Flojo and it'll color them. And if you put in a bunch of clusters and you're trying to figure out, you know, was that chartreuse or cyan and so forth, which was which, so you just have them as numbers here. So just the convenience for later. You can also get the MFIs out as a CSV. So at any point, if you're like, cool, what I really just wanted from my output was the MFI of every one of the parameters for every cluster, you got it. Okay. Cool. Those are the outputs that are now sitting in a folder if we want them. What we've got right in Flojo, if I go back to the layout editor, is the ability to just drag in that flow sum of live. Kaboom. This is what I was saying is going to be pretty intense, where it's trying to squeeze in 40 different colors into that heat map, and that gets tough to read. We'll probably have to do it with fewer to really make sense of it. But here are our 20 output clusters by color, and every circle in this group is one of the original 100 nodes. So it plots them out, draws a line between them. The length of the line is how different they were. And then it finds a breakpoint where it says, okay, that line is particularly long. And here's a good junction point. We'll cut that off and say, this is one cluster and that is another. The cluster numbers correspond to the flow sum clusters here. And so if we wanted to dig into any of those clusters, we could do so. We could also get a general feel for the data. Okay, looks like they were you know, two big distinct branches of the data. If we had to guess, we'd probably say, you know, lymphocytes and monocytes, maybe dendritic cells are in there somewhere. And then each of these bars here is telling you how positive that cluster was for each of the particular parameters. Tough to read this one. We'll have to break that down into having a smaller number of parameters to figure out each one of those where if we wanted to use this plot to figure it out, uh, we could do so in a variety of different manners. One of them being Cluster Explorer. So let's look at a few different ways to look at this cluster data. Actually, I'll keep that layout for now. Hit the plus. One of them, you bother to make that Tisney plot. And so Tisney is really nice for, I go in and I say, let's also put Tisney on here. Um, don't forget there is a search bar in all your access selections. So if I want to find Tisney quickly, I type the T to save me some scrolling time. Okay. Uh, so Trisha Niles has a nice question. Uh, what do you think about running phenograph to get number of clusters and then using number of flow sum? Sure, absolutely. My guys use that all the time. Uh, so phenograph will give you an estimate of the number of clusters. You'll get a little thing called modularity that'll give you the number and the, the estimate of how good that number was. If you get a modularity number closer to one, then phenograph is pretty sure there were that many clusters in it. That would work. If you prefer the output of FlowSum, uh, it's so quick that it's not too big a deal to run that after having run Phenograph. You could also use things like Cluster Explorer and some overlays with Tisney to compare and contrast the results. Yeah, great suggestion. Okay, uh, 
All right, I'm gonna highlight the rest of them, drop them on top. And so now we have a breakdown of how our clustering results plot on TISNY. And so we see there's pretty good agreement and that there's a lot of these that really stand out as, yep, that looks like a separate cluster. And then a few of them where you're wondering, like this purple one here, hmm, wonder if that could have turned into two. Uh, typical FlowJo tools are all useful here. If you're thinking, hmm, those two pinks are pretty similar, I'd rather, rather have something else, maybe much lighter pink in there. Feel free, feel free to make any changes. So it looks like a lot of them stand out. A couple of them, hmm, I don't know, that dark green one, for example, maybe there's actually more than one dark green and so I should not jump to conclusions there. Uh, yes, there were. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so that's one way to take a look at the clusters. Another way is that we could look at uh, an overlay, perhaps, of how this compares to the actual manual gaming. And so I could do something like, you know, throw the live on there. And I could grab a bunch of my downstream populations and just start overlaying them on this Disney map and say, so where did these fall? And do I see some areas of you know, consistency, of agreement with the clustering results, with the type of cells that came out with my manual gating? Oops, too much. Okay, so cool, there's our, our eights, our 45s, 56s, all jumping to particular regions, the T cells all going together, a, a good sign. <laughs> All right, maybe drop all our monocyte populations in here just to, I'm gonna guess populate the top of that plot. Hey, look at that. Okay, so there we go. Manually, uh, perhaps we missed that there were, you know, a few more different monocyte macrophage distinctions within here. Uh, maybe comparatively, we divided up the, you know, some of these uh, CD4 positive populations a little more so. But anyway, if you really want to dig into it, let's bust out the Cluster Explorer. I'm going to click on that. No, actually, so it was the live population that I really started with. Let's start with live. I'm going to Plugins, Cluster Explorer. If you run this tool, it'll ask, have you done a clustering? And pick which one you'd like to use. I've only done one, so there's only one choice here at the moment. Easy enough. And then there is some choices for, do you have any derived parameters? So a creative parameter, like TSD plots, or maybe UMAP, if you prefer that. And I'll say, OK. And it's going to generate this interface. Oops, that is a little squishy. Still waiting to see if that's going to finish. I'm expecting to see the Tisney plot pop up. And the gist will be that we can click on particular populations and see them highlight on the Tisney plot and as a line chart and as a heat map. So it looks like something perhaps messed up there. All right. I may either want to rerun that or I could try also, I was going to demo just taking out a particular population and doing a concatenate, then rerunning it. Let's do that. Let's combine two things. I see we have about 16 minutes left. Okay, so we'll come back to Cluster Explorer. Not sure what happened there. I uh, tested it and that seemed to work nicely in the run through. I have done something different apparently here. But okay, so that was just, I've got these live cells. I want to find out what's going on with my live cell population. So I ran a clustering and a Tisney on everything. Let's now say, cool, but I expect that, you know, I want to see the differences between different samples. And maybe I don't want to just compare everything. Maybe I want to zone in on the CD positive, uh, C, sorry, CD20 positive B cells. Uh, I'm going to click on the population I'm interested in. I'm going to go to edit and select equivalent nodes. That'll just highlight the CD20 positive B cells all throughout my workspace. I'm going to right click on that. I'm going to export slash concatenate and choose concatenate. I want to put all these guys together. I want the compensated version of these parameters. I just want them concatenated. This stuff's fine. Let's do so. Okay. I'll put them right back into my existing workspace. I'm going to quick make a group called concat and look for hmm, touchpads, too sensitive, files that contain. Concat, 
And hey, look, there's just one. Cool. OK, so if I look into my CD20 positive B cells, should be the group that has 100% of the events. Hey, there we go. One thing that I want to point out right off the top is that when you concatenate, Flojo adds something called sample ID as an extra parameter. And so I can go back in and break apart the things I concatenated so I can do direct comparison of them after the fact, anytime I want. Uh, and as a little trick, I can right click on any kind of histogram plot, say create gates on peaks, and I will auto gate on those. So here they are, just randomly given a number between 0 and 262144, sort of the standard flow cytometry scale. You could have added your own parameter uh, in that concatenate menu. There was an option for add a parameter using any keywords. So you could have given it a, a more meaningful number to you. I'm good with just knowing that they will be in the same order I collected them for the time being. And now I've got those that when I want to break them out, I can. All right, so I'm going to run a quick T-SNE on these. This will only take about a minute because we've got a lot less, let's take out the live dead this time. We've got a lot less events by picking a specific population, picking annoy and Phosphoria again, run. And then we can go in and we can see where are the differences in these files. I think it's a really nice approach to do analysis you know, without any kind of uh, you know, specific gating strategy or, uh, or, or plan uh, in that you can say, so I've just got my real cells, you know, whatever, uh, however you've achieved them. I've run Flow AI, I did my live dead gate, et cetera. Maybe I only care about CD20 positives, whatever it might be that you make some very easy gates at the top, create a Tisney plot and just overlay them and see which parts of the data vary between your different conditions and then go in and phenotype those cells. Uh, rather than phenotyping everything, and then going back through the rest of the data and looking for the places where specific phenotypes are different, let's go find the spots that are different you know, right away and then go figure out what they are. Okay, so this one took, when I practiced it, uh, 52 seconds, so we shouldn't have a whole lot longer to wait for that to pop up. Coffee sipping break. And we'll try to rock this out in the next just couple of minutes. Yes, it is 2.18. Okay, and once those pop out, we could cluster them, we could do cluster explorer, anything like that. And so also just pointing out, so whatever that is, 100,000 events, give or take, uh, 40 parameters, 50 seconds. It's, you know, again, try to, try to not force you to, uh, to have to do any down sampling if you don't want. Okay, cool. So we've got a Tisney plot. We've got our various samples. So something we could do is in the layout editor, the plus, just take our various samples and overlay them. Right click and hold. Seems to me too. Cool. And then see, are there any populations here that really stand out as maybe having come from one particular sample or another? And I, I think I see two, maybe three right away. It looks like this blue population is almost entirely from POP3. The green population up here, almost entirely from population five, and that purple edge maybe entirely from population four. So almost all of the different samples we have have all of these kind of cells. It's just a mix in here. And anything more towards the middle, which is very common, and a couple that are super bright perhaps, for one parameter or two parameters, they really stand out as different from the rest of the events. And they really stand out particularly on an individual sample. So if these samples were different biologically, and we were looking for a way to uh, find some kind of biomarker for them, this might be a nice approach. And so we can go to those CD20 positive B cells. We can create our TSNE plot. Oop, there it is. T, TSNE versus other TSNE. And I could just say, draw a gator on these. I'm not gonna use necessarily the stats on TSNE, but I do wanna call this a query gate, just to try to figure out what they are. I'm gonna drag in all of these, get the whole TSNE plot, 
drag in my query gate, overlay those things. I like using a bright color and like a dull gray or something to really emphasize where they're different. Right click on this plot, say make a multigraph overlay of all the histograms. You can right click on this plot and select multiple parameters and take out anything you're not interested in, like <laughs> event number doesn't seem particularly promising or a sample ID. Let's keep the rest and take out the Disney ones. And then we've created just a profile of what these cells are versus all of the rest of the cells in our analysis. And we can just scroll through this and move my Zoom chat box and say, okay, what are they bright for? All right, a little more APCR 700. Uh, labels didn't come through the concatenation process. You don't have to check on the date on why that's true. But we could go figure out what that is just by clicking on the sample. And a little brighter for a handful of these other markers. You know, pack orange, uh, definitely a nice shift we see in e floor 710. And so just a way to start identifying the populations that perhaps might be significantly different between conditions. All right, and then let's give Cluster Explorer one more go. So let me throw a clustering routine on these. I will use flow sum again since it is so fast and we are up against our time. All right, selected everything. Yeah, good enough. Call it 20 again, why not? Maybe they, so let's go 10. There's a small, lot fewer just within the B cell population, like all the rest of that, say okay. Could have probably chosen fewer markers if I was going to be careful, and that probably there's a lot of these we don't expect to impact our CD20 B cells, but you know can't hurt too much at the moment, although getting rid of, again, parameters that we think are going to be the same for every one of the cells does make the clustering results better because it, you know, it just makes them uh, a little less similar for things that we've gated to specifically. Okay, so we've got a result. Let's give Cluster Explorer another whirl here. All right, flow sum result. We've got our TC of the B cells, go. Huh, another funky version. Oh, did I pick comp and uncomped? I bet I did. Let's look through that one more time. Last chance, we'll give this one more try. I bet I had a variety of things selected. Let's just pick a subset here to make sure. I've only got a handful of things selected and didn't pick comped and uncomped. Nope. Okay. Well, Cluster Explorer is not going to behave for me. I will say, give that one a whirl. Uh, I think it's a really nice tool and it's very interactive and it worked in practice so I can put my finger on the problem. It's probably the, uh, it's probably the, uh, the issue sitting between the chair and the computer, aka me, and I'm just not seeing what I'm doing. We'll fix it. <laughs> okay, Ben Daniel says he updated his Cluster Explorer and he's getting something similar. Ah, ben, hopefully that's it and then we can just make an update and fix it, but I will claim I ran this so oh, half an hour before starting this webinar on the same data doing the same steps, except something I'm messing up and doing differently here and now I'm getting a different result. So anyway, we'll give Cluster Explorer a look. Maybe there's a problem, maybe it's me. We'll figure it out. We also had another update that we were going to push soon in that uh, for advanced users only, uh, we want to be able to uh, remove outliers. We wanna be able to use the clustering results to figure out what an outlier might look like. You know, say, I don't know, some cell that is in a whole bunch of all of the populations, you know, maybe uh, doesn't fit in with the rest of its cluster and we can clean that up and get you, you know, better, better results. Wouldn't wanna use it willy nilly and lose data, but you know, uh, perhaps for someone who's going to very carefully use it, you know, we could put it in. So I think there's an update coming no matter what to Cluster Explorer. Okay, with that, I've got about five minutes here. I'm gonna glance at the chat. Yeah, Ben and Helen, Heleny, sure. We will uh, we'll check out what's going on with Cluster Explorer and get back to you. Any other questions? Coffee sipping break. Okay. Not seeing that happening and not seeing anything coming in. Uh, turning back on video for a second. Okay, uh, show the plugin wizard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so from the wizard, uh, 
<laughs> just because it's set up as a as a, a population-based plugin, you have to have something clicked on. Doesn't matter what. Uh, plugins, plugin wizard, and so right here you can go into what's new on the exchange, and then if there's one that you want to update, click on it, and I'll actually I'll actually do it this time, um, and it just you can see it just goes to the exchange, grabs the uh, grabs the zip file, and so it's still on you to uh, unzip it and grab the jar file, and I might as well since I actually needed to update this one, and drop it into your, oops, it zooms in the way, uh, drop it into your plugins folder. So the plugins, open finder, embed some, update it. That's it. Okay, my version does not show the wizard in the workspace, uh, so the wizard itself does have to be installed first. So sorry about that. We <laughs> probably could make to use the plugin wizard, not itself a plugin. So you will have to make sure you've downloaded the plugin wizard, you've dropped it into wherever you want to keep the jar files, and then use the preferences and diagnostics to scan for plugins. Oops, and tell us where you've put the plugin wizard, and then restart Flojo. Uh, it'll only show uh, whatever plugins were in the folder at the time when it started. So if you add some while you've got the program started or you put in what the folder is uh, after you start the program, which of course has to be, it'll show them on the next restart. Uh, if you update a plugin, do you have to reinstall the R code? The answer is generally no, in that almost all of the R code are things like um, just connect us to Flowcore or Bioconductor, um, sort of just general. Um, what is flow cytometry data for R, like letting R know what an FCS file is. It's, it's sort of the, the base language that was written for all plugins. Most of them just kind of need to know what an FCS file is. Occasionally the plugin itself will update and then you will want to update what the, uh, what the code is, um, you know, beyond just whatever, beyond what the R is. But most of it, the plugin itself is the code that is, um, doing the actual work that is actually running the calculations. If we update that, doesn't matter, you know, about the R base because, again, the R base is just being used to let it handle an FCS file. So generally, no. Uh, I would definitely say that that plugin wizard check for updates bit, though, is a good thing. We'll have that handle most of it for you. Okay. So I think that was all the questions, John. Um, there were a couple of questions privately sent about the option of um, doing another session to explore other higher parameter uh, data analysis options in Flojo, so we could always work on that and communicate with everyone. So no decisions today, but we'll absolutely work towards okay. that. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that was it for, for questions, unless anyone has any, uh, any wrap-ups. And just as a reminder, um, as you have that opportunity to think of any um, any leftover questions we are recording this session it's, it has been recorded and for all of our registrants and attendees this will be uh, the link to this will be sent out uh, later today likely um, by the end of the day fantastic I, and I'll say the one thing I promised to do and didn't do was just point out that on our own webinars page learn and webinars there is a explore previously recorded webinars and so some of this here can be found including I, where I did the spectral talk and then the Astrolabe talk is over here. And so those are, those are available as well, including some stuff on just how do I get a plugin? Uh, plugins in Flojo, for example. So uh, some of that is also available as a webinar already. And thank you, Kathy, for organizing. Really appreciate it. This was cool. Of course, it's, it's uh, Rui, myself, and, and everyone. So it's, we're really appreciative for you being here, and um, we'll absolutely communicate with everyone for the coming weeks what the topics are going to be. And thank you endlessly to John for helping us out for this session, and, um, and we hope everyone uh, stays safe. Okay, thanks, guys. Take care, all. <laughs>